a foretaste of glory divine, heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. Perfect submission, perfect delight, visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending bring from above echoes of mercy. Whispers of love. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. My Savior, all the day long.
come, oh come, Emmanuel, and ransom captive Israel. That mourns in lonely exile here until the Son of God appears. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel. darkness covered them like a, a cold wet blanket darkness stillness a hushed anxiety upon their hearts they had been there a thousand times before walking among the valley staff in hand quiet bleeding in their hearts No one thought much of them, and truth be told, um, they were always a little unclean. It's difficult to get the smell off their garments. Men of no royal lineage, men of no wealth or fortune or fame, outcast of society, if you will. Yeah, certainly no one thought much of them, nothing more than a resource guarding a resource. And so they watched and, and waited. It was, it was their job, a, a, a very, very, very important job. And in the quiet darkness, the most startling thing unfolded. The angel of the Lord appeared before the shepherds, keeping watch over their flock by night. Light in the darkness... Glory of the Lord shone around them. Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. For unto you, I mean, you shepherds in the field, you unclean and unworthy, for unto you was born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord, this will be a sign for you. You'll find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. Why? Of all people, why? Why not the princes and the kings? Why not the rulers of the day? Why not the religious leaders in the temple? Of all people, why? Why bring good news of, of great joy to some shepherds out in the field. Why? Well, because the story of Christmas, because the story of the gospel is for all people. Why? Because the joy of Christ is being offered to the man or woman that everyone loves and to the man or woman that everyone hates. That the joy of Christ is being offered to the lowly, to the poor, to the addict, to the divorced, to the heartbroken, to the grieving, to the depressed, to the anxious, to the lonely, to people who have nothing to bring to the table. Emmanuel, God with us, means that joy is offered to people like us. It means that the joy of Christ is offered to someone like you. So let me show you why that is really good news for us today. 
like last week, we'll begin in Isaiah 9. If you have a digital Bible, I'll read out of the ESV. If you have a bulletin, uh, both of the main passages are there in the bulletin on the back side. Um, but let's, let's pray before we study together. Father, we uh, come before you and open your word and gather as brothers and sisters in Christ and routinely and, and rightly remember the humbleness of Christ in the manger. But Father, should that not humble us? Who are we? Who am I that you would offer that kind of joy in my life? A joy that extends beyond a moment, a joy that extends into every moment for eternity. God, teach us what the joy of Christ is in our life this morning through Isaiah 9 and John 3. And we pray these things in your son's name. Amen. What does Emmanuel mean? Well, as I mentioned last week and this morning, Emmanuel means God with us. So we began in uh, Isaiah 9, verses 1 through 2, a prophet in the land around 740 B.C., a time when the Assyrian Empire was rising, plundering the area of northern Galilee, a time of gloom and darkness. And so the prophet speaks. Isaiah, he, he speaks a word of hope for the people. Isaiah speaks a prophecy of the Messiah to come. It's a reminder from last week, point one, that Christ brings light to the world. Just to explain that from last week, it's a light for those that walk in darkness, a light for those to bear witness, a light for those to become children of God. But Emmanuel doesn't end there. There's more than just light with us. This is also a message of joy. So Isaiah 9, I'll just read two verses from there. Verse 3, starting in verse 3. You have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with the joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil for the yoke of his burden, the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. That the Messiah, that Christ Jesus brings joy into the darkness, and that joy is realized in two different ways in verses 3 and 4. First, the joy is realized through multiplication. So the joy of Christ is not just for Israel, that the joy of Christ is multiplied among the nations. It's a joy at the harvest. It's a joy at the divided spoil, meaning that as we gather in Carter County to celebrate Christmas, the prophecy of verses 3 through 4 are true, that the joy of Christ has made it from the Middle East to East Tennessee. That the Christ is the fulfillment of Isaiah 9, but also Isaiah 49. Just look at Isaiah 49, verse 6. It says, he says, it is too light a thing that you should be my servant and raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the preserved of Israel. I will make you as a light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. But secondly, it's because the joy of Christ, it, it, it crushes the enemy. So I, Isaiah, he prophesies with this illustration of of the war in Midian, that Christ will free his people from the enemy, just as Gideon freed God's people from Midian and Judges 7. So let me just give you one verse for context. This is uh, Judges 7, verse 20. Then the three companies blew the trumpets and broke the jars. They held in their left hand the torches and in their right hands the trumpets to blow, and they cried out, sword for the Lord and for Gideon. So the men of Israel... Men of Israel called out of Naphtali and Asher and Manasseh, pursued, and they struck down the Midianites. That's, that's the twofold rejoicing that we see in verses 3 and verse 4. That the joy of the Messiah is for the nations. The joy of the Messiah is victory over the enemy. So what does Emmanuel mean? I, I gave you the first last week. Let me give you the second one uh, if you're a note taker today. Point two that Christ brings joy to the world. 
Christ brings joy to the world. Yeah, it's the great Christmas carol written in 1719. He rules the world with truth and grace and makes the nations prove the glories of his righteousness and wonders of his love and wonders of his love and wonders and wonders of his love. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. That, That Christ brings joy to the world, the nations prove, the enemy defeated. And yet, you know, what's that look like in your life? We know what happiness looks like, I think. Happiness is a long vacation. Happiness is a gift that you've always wanted. Happiness is a nap after an exhausting day. Happiness is a party without drama. Happiness is this moment in time when everything just works out how you wanted it to work out. And yet happiness is is fleeting, here for a a minute, gone the next, a chasing of the wind, because happiness wasn't spread to the nations, it was joy. Like, what could that actually look like? Even this month, I mean, what, what could it look like for you to live with joy in December? I think we should focus on the guy who actually found it. The man who found complete joy even when his life was burning around him. The man who introduced Christ to the world, a man named John the Baptist. So we will return to the Gospel of John. You want to turn there? If you have a physical Bible with me, we'll be in John chapter 3 for the rest of our time together. Let me read this account. This is John chapter 3, um, starting in verse 25. Now a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you across the Jordan, to whom you bore witness, look, look, he's, he's baptizing, and all are going to him. And John answered, a person cannot receive even one thing unless it's given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear witness that I said, I'm not the Christ, but I've been sent before him. The one who has the bride as the bridegroom, the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him, rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks in an earthly way. He who comes from heaven is above all. He bears witness to what he has seen and heard, and yet no one receives his testimony. Whoever receives his testimony sets his seal to this, that God is true. For he whom God has sent utters the words of God. For he gives the Spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Scene is being set. Jesus is with his disciples in the Judean countryside, and his disciples are are baptizing people as they went. On the other side, we have John near Salem. He's baptizing people as they were coming to him. So both groups are dunking people under the water, at the time a sign of of repentance, purification. Team Jesus, Team John, which is why this argument begins in verses 25 through 29. Hey, Rabbi, the name they have given John. Hey, Rabbi, the guy with you crossing the Jordan, the guy who you bore witness to, look, Like, don't you see, Rabbi, that that Jesus is baptizing and they're all going to him, not you? Which is wrong on many levels. First, Jesus isn't baptizing anyone. 
His disciples were. You can see proof of that in John chapter 4, verses 1 through 2. But secondly, this thing isn't a competition. That Jesus and John are not competing in ministry. They're being faithful to their individual calling. So like we just celebrated a year of, of ministry this morning. Ten baptisms in this church. But you know what? I didn't even baptize all of them. One of them wasn't even with our church. And you know what? Some churches probably baptized a lot less than us. Some churches probably baptized a lot more than us. And that's all okay. Because it's not a competition. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's not about East River Park. It's about Christ Jesus. Like, I don't give anyone salvation, even though I want to. You want to save someone, you can't. It's only what has been given from heaven. You know who knows that more than anyone else? Yeah, John the Baptist. Because there is no joy in ministry when it becomes some petty comparison game. No, John responds, starting in verse 27, a person cannot receive even one thing in his lesson is given from heaven. You heard me. I said I'm not the Christ. I've only been sent before him. How could you possibly compare me to him? Just to paraphrase. And then he, then he takes it a step further. John illustrates this relationship in the form of a covenant wedding that Christ Jesus is the bridegroom, that we are the bride. And even more humble, John says, look, I'm just a friend of the bridegroom. I stand and hear him. I rejoice greatly just because I heard his voice. And the startling words at the end of verse 29 Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. What kind of joy does, does John the Baptist have? I'll give you a few things that will apply to us as well. Here's letter A. It's a joy in hearing his voice. A joy in hearing his voice. I know it gets a little wordy. And confusing sometimes. So let's zoom out from this narrative and just see what's going on. John has faithfully proclaimed Christ. John has faithfully baptized those who come. John has faithfully called sin what it is, sin. And if you don't know the end of the story, the faithfulness of John will eventually get him thrown in prison and his head chopped off and served on a platter for people to mock. So from the outside looking in, that's what John gets for being faithful to Christ. A very difficult and deadly life. So he's given this opportunity here in the narrative to claim just a little credit. He's given an opportunity to at least pat himself on the back. And what does he do? No, friend. I didn't do this work. I can't. Only Jesus can. I just, I just stand here and listen to him. I just stand and rejoice just to listen to his voice. That's my joy. My joy is, is complete just to hear his voice. So I'm going to shoot real straight with you um, this morning. Is that the kind of joy that you crave? The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, Emmanuel God with us, that to possess real joy is to hear His voice. John 10, verse 27, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. To hear the voice of our shepherd, how do we do that? Well, hopefully it's obvious. It's to, to listen and to read the proclamation of the word. Jesus, the word incarnate. So do you want joy? Well, then open your Bible each day and listen to the bridegroom. You want joy? Well, show up to church. For real. I mean, even, even when you don't feel like it. And listen to the bridegroom with a community of believers that want the same thing as you. That there is no joy to the world without the word of the Lord. It's Psalm 119, 97. 
Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. If you want joy this Christmas, it won't be because everything worked out perfectly. Promise it never does. Our schedule um, has been packed. We've had some serious behavior issues with our children at home. We haven't even put up the Christmas lights outside at this point. Just not going to happen this year. And, and yet my joy is complete because my eyes have, have been on the word. And when my eyes read the word, my ears hear the voice of the Lord. So I promise you, there's enough guys out there that are chasing some sort of, of dream of success. There's enough videos online of, of men showing you how to hustle and make good money. So let me specifically address men of East River Park. Joy is not a feminine quality. It's a quality of a man or woman that hears from the Lord. Emmanuel, Christ with us, his word with us. Are you going to actually believe that and read and listen to that word? All right. Let her be. It's a joy in exalting his name. So John, he completes his, his thought in verse 30. A well-known one-liner, he, he being Christ, must increase. But I, I being John, must decrease. You want to know the secret of living a miserable life? <laughs> if you want to wake up every day, you're like, I don't need a secret. I'm already there. Um, want to wake up every day and feel empty, without purpose, drained. You want to grind it out at a terrible job, just living for the weekend. Do you want to know the secret of hating your life? Here it is. Make everything about you. That the most miserable people I've ever met are the most narcissistic people I've ever met. Everything is about them. Every good thing is about them. Every bad thing is a pity party about them. The answer to a, a, a joyful life is not to look deeper into yourself. That's the lie of a secular culture that worships self. So I, I guess it makes sense if that's where you're at. There's no joy in, in looking at others. The answer to a joyful life was not to compare yourself or per context compare your ministry to someone else. That, that comparison only makes you a Pharisee or a defeated man. It just never makes you a, a joyful child of God. So John has, has unlocked what I, what I fail to unlock in my heart time and time again. I must decrease, Christ must increase. It's not about me, I've already said it. It's not about you, it's not about East River Park. It's about the exaltation of Christ Jesus. Why? Well, verse 31, because he who comes from above is above all. He who comes from heaven is a Above all, that Jesus is not some baby in the manger. He is above all and over all. John knew what Paul would write in Colossians 1, starting in verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So you might ask me, you know, well, I hear what you're saying. How do I live a more joyful life? And the answer would be, ah, you're asking the wrong question. Because the better question is, how do I, how do I decrease so Christ can increase? Because when you begin to answer that question, you unlock true eternal joy, a kind of joy that, that can't be squashed when you're having a bad day or you hear difficult news, a kind of joy that John could still have while he was in prison, a life of exalting, lifting up the name of Jesus, Psalm 4610, be still. 
Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in earth. It's a rejoicing of Isaiah 9, rejoicing of Psalm 46, a rejoicing of John 3. Be still this month. I know it's easier said than done. Be still. Quit thinking about yourself so much. Quit living in the dark spaces of your mind. Quit acting like a narcissistic martyr. Stop. Be still. He will be exalted among the nations. So let every thought and action be redirected to making much of Christ Jesus. If you do that, if I do that, well, I promise this, this joy of mine will increase. What does this joy look like? I'll, I'll give you the last one. Here's letter C. It's a joy in receiving his testimony. Receiving his testimony. In verses 32 through 36, you see the culmination of John's speech. And like we learned last week, Christ came to the world. The world did not receive him. Christ came to his own people. They did not receive him. So for anyone that might deny the Trinity or downplay the significance of that reality, better take a long look at verses 34 and 35. Because Christ, the Son of God, utters the words of God for Christ gives the Holy Spirit, for the Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. So John, right there in chapter 3, unpacks the reality of, of the Trinitarian God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Why does that matter? What does that have to do with Emmanuel? Well, verse 36, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life but the wrath of God. Emmanuel, God with us, means that God saved us from God. So to receive Christ Jesus, to believe that he has come to die for us, to rise from the dead for us, means that he saved us from the wrath of God. And I don't think a lot of us think about that as we gather around the Christmas tree, but who else has the power and the authority to stop the wrath of God? Well, only God. And to be clear, maybe you didn't catch it, all right? To receive Christ is twofold in verse 36. It is to whoever believes in the Son, and this is to whoever obeys the Son. Meaning you didn't actually receive Christ if you just believed. We've heard it. Even the demons do that. It's always a believing and obeying. The world is full of people that believe in God. Go, go around this county. Ask how many people believe there's a God. But they lack true joy because they don't obey God. They received the ideologies of Christianity, but they never received Christ. It's always a, a believing and obeying. That is the joy that has come into the world, a joy that saves us from the wrath of God. Joy to the world. The Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room. To receive the king is to receive salvation from the wrath of God. That's the joy of Emmanuel. So it's my confession. A confession um, that I'm honestly embarrassed to publicly admit. My wife and I have, um, we've been married for over 16 years, and this is the first year that we have actually made a, a list of, of Christmas gifts that we need to buy, and that we've tracked them in a Christmas budget. So which means for 15 years of marriage, um, it's been just swipe the card and pray every December. I'm going to trust that I'm not alone in that one. Um, so on Wednesday night, uh, this week, the children went to bed. We looked at our list, several names, missing presents, um, crunching the numbers with the remaining mon money in our Christmas budget. Uh, and to be fair, it is a way more freeing way to manage money. Um, but that list is, is still incomplete. We have a few more presents to get before December 25th. 
So yeah, I don't, I don't know if your Christmas list is complete, but the better question is, is, is your joy? I mean, what, a, what an astonishing thing for John to say in verse 29. With everything going on in his life, he's not, a, he's not, about to, he's not breathing his last. For him to say, therefore, this joy of mine is complete. I don't know if I can always say that one. I want to say it, I just don't always feel it. It does feel like there's, there's too many things in the way before I could, could possibly say something like that. Is your joy complete? Because here's the truth of the gospel. If you're in Christ, the list is complete because Christ is complete. That we can possess complete joy because the source of our joy is in the all-sufficient, complete Christ. So, I mean, simply, if you have Christ, you already have it all. Emmanuel, Christ with us, means joy with us. That's your main point, and I'll pray. Christ with us means joy with us. Let's pray together. God, for, forgive us as a church. Forgive me for thinking that there's a hundred different things that need to line up or that need to be accomplished before I could possibly say that my joy is complete. God, we're, we're thankful for Christ Jesus who has offered joy to the world the all-sufficient, all-powerful, above all Christ Jesus. He is complete. So if we have Christ, we can have complete joy. I thank you for that reminder of your word this morning, and I, I pray that we would hold on to that uh, this week as we go through a thousand different situations, and we pray these things in your son's name. Amen.